In this video, we're going to look at some notes on graphing inverse variations. The general formula for a parent function of an inverse variation is f of x equals 1 over x or y equals 1 over x. When I don't know how to graph something, where I usually start is by making a table of values. I'm going to make my table of values over here on the right. I know you could make yours underneath on your own paper. So if I start out, the things I would usually plug into a table if I were doing this by hand would be negative 3 to 3 probably. And some of these I can just plug in in my head because I'm just doing 1 divided by x. So 1 divided by negative 3 is negative a third. 1 divided by negative 2 is negative a half. 1 divided by negative 1 is negative 1. 1 divided by 0 gives me a problem, right? 1 divided by 0 does not exist. We can't do division by 0. So something's going to happen strange to my graph there. 1 divided by 1 is 1. 1 divided by 2 is a half. 1 divided by 3 is a third. I could plot these points on my graph. It's kind of hard to plot the little fractions, but I'm just getting as close as I can. I'm going to make a big jump here because I don't know what to do when x equals 0. And I have this just a few points. If I went way over to the left, so say I plugged in like a negative 10 for x, my y would be negative a tenth, and I would be up here close to the axis. If I plugged in a positive 10, my y would be like a tenth, and I'd be way over here. Um, this is because on the ends, if I take 1 and I divide it by a big number, my answer is going to be a small number. So that's going to be close to 0. So what happens with the ends of this thing is I have a horizontal asymptote. We remember asymptotes from exponential functions. I have a horizontal asymptote for this thing on the x-axis. That's at y equals 0. I have to still look at what's happening near x equals 0. So maybe I want to pick some more points to sneak into my table. What happens if I do 1 divided by a small number? Well, for example, if I do 1 divided by a half, that's going to equal 2. So up here on my graph, I could put a new point over a half up 2. If it were negative, it would be down here at negative 2. 1 divided by a small number becomes a bigger number because the small number goes in lots of times. Okay, So a bigger number means it's going to get bigger and bigger. If I divide it by a really tiny number, let's say I did 1 divided by 1 tenth. So now I'm really close to the x-axis. My y value would then be 10, and I would be way up here near the top. So what happens for my inverse variation is it has two pieces. The pieces get close to the x-axis on the left and right, and the pieces get close to the y-axis in the middle. So what we have that we haven't seen before is we have also a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So that's our general shape. We could, if we wanted to, go into the table function of our calculator. We could type it into the table. And we could scroll through and we can see these same points that we would get. Um, our calculator gives us an error when x equals 0 because that was our vertical asymptote. I could also go into my graph menu of my calculator and look at the picture of this thing. And I can see it makes this shape. This is called a hyperbola shape, a hyperbolic shape. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about that name, but it's the graph of the inverse variation. So let's go through and fill in some of the details on this. So I got my table out of the way here so I can fill in my information. So the zeros, what are the zeros? Remember the zeros and the x-intercepts are the same thing. Looking at our picture, the x-axis is an asymptote, so we don't have any. This doesn't have any zeros or x-intercepts. The y-intercept is where we hit the y-axis, which again for this one is an asymptote, so there isn't one of those either. As we start moving this thing left and right, we'll get some intercepts, but not now. The vertical asymptote was the y-axis, whose equation was x equals 0. The horizontal asymptote was the x-axis, whose equation was y equals 0. So, increasing and decreasing. Remember, we have to draw from left to right. 
to decide if we're increasing or from left to right to decide if we're decreasing. If I'm going to draw over this function and I'm going to start over here on the left and I'm going to keep drawing the entire time my graph is going down. So I have a whole section right there that's decreasing. Now I have a second branch of this function, but if I start on the left of this branch and keep drawing, it's still going down the entire time. So my function is never increasing. It's only decreasing. When I write the intervals from where I'm decreasing, I want it to be decreasing everywhere, but I can't be decreasing at x equals zero because I don't exist there. So my first branch, if I were to label uh, my arrows like I normally do when I graph a function, this arrow over here on the left of the function is on the left, so x is negative infinity. The y value of that arrow would be getting closer to zero for this arrow that's pointing down, my x value is getting closer to zero, and my y value is going down, so it's getting closer to negative infinity. For the arrow up here on the top, my x value is close to zero, and my y value is going up, so that's positive infinity. And then I have an arrow over here on the right side where my x value is becoming large, so it's positive infinity, and my y value is getting closer to zero. When I'm describing where I'm decreasing, I always want to use the x values. So for my first interval here, my x value started at negative infinity and went to zero. So I'm going to write that as negative infinity is less than x is less than zero. Then I have my second interval. My second interval is this piece right here. It starts when x is 0 and keeps going forever. So when I write that interval, it's going to be from 0 is less than x is less than positive infinity. I can't put it all in one piece because I don't exist at x equals 0. With the end behavior, the end behavior is what's happening with y as x does something. As x goes to infinity, on my graph, that's the right side over here. As x goes to infinity, the y is getting closer and closer to 0. Again, that relates back to this right here. 1 divided by a really big number is going to become a small number. As x approaches negative infinity, which was the left side of my graph, my y was also going to 0. And again, that's the same thing as a small number close to zero. It's just a negative small number. For the domain and range, I'm going to start with the anchor point of my graph, which is right here at the origin, because I didn't move at all. And I want to ask, do I go forever left and right for the domain? I do, but I don't exist at x equals zero because of the division by zero was against the rules. So I'm going to put a restriction, x such that x is not equal to, that's an equal to sign with a slash through it, zero. And in the range, I want to look and say, do I go up and down forever? I do go up and down forever, but I have a horizontal asymptote right here that I don't touch at y equals zero. So I'm going to write y such that y is not equal to zero. So this is all the information for our parent function of one over x. If you turn the paper over, we're going to do a transformation. On this one, we're graphing g of x is equal to 1 over x plus 2 with a plus 3 on the end. So what have I done to my original function? I started with f of x was 1 over x. Well, I've changed the x down here. The x is now an x plus 2. So that plus 2 would be considered on the inside because it's with the x. I've also put this plus 3 on the outside. The plus 3 is on the end, which would be considered to the outside because it's done after I did the parent function of 1 divided by x. So we should realize, what are these things going to do? A plus 2 on the inside should move us left 2. And a plus 3 on the outside should move us up 2, up 3, sorry. So if I start out and I do my movements, 
and I go two to the left and up three, this is going to be the center point of my graph right there. That's my anchor point or my original origin. If I think back to my original function, in my original function, that's where the asymptotes were. So I'm going to have an asymptote right here, a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. And I'm going to have an asymptote right here, which is a horizontal asymptote. So that's y equals 3. And that's going to be how I'm going to start my graph. So all the counting I'm going to do from my table, it's going to be from the intersection of these two asymptotes. As far as nice points on my graph, my table really only had a couple. Negative 1, negative 1, 0 was does not exist, and 1, 1. So when I go to put the points on the graph, the only ones that really fit nicely are the two that are diagonally from that intersection. I could also plug in some bigger points. If I plugged in 2, then my y was a half. Again, this is for my parent function. So from my anchor point, I'm going to count over 2 up a half and uh, 2 to the left down a half. And we can see this is going to make this same shape. I should be able to do this without a calculator. I'm not going to ask you guys to graph these so much without a calculator. So let's go over to our table. Um, we can make a graph. My function, if I want to type it in, is 1 divided by, I need to put the x plus 2 in parentheses to show that the whole thing is on the bottom, and then the plus 3 outside of the parentheses. If I draw this, my graph winds up looking kind of like a heart monitor. Uh, that's because the calculator can get confused. It's plugging in points just like you are on your table. And in my calculator, it's plugging in points and it's plotting them. And then it's connecting the dots. And what happens is it's down here on the bottom. It plugs in x is negative 2.1 and it gets a negative y value. And the next point it plugs in is up here at the top and it gets a y value. So it connects those dots and makes it look like a heart monitor. That's not really what happens. So we're going to have to be smarter than our calculator, and on our graph, we're not going to connect those. We're going to put a dashed line. Another thing you can do to help this go away is if you go into Shift F3 and look at your view window. Uh, one of the things that I can do is I can go to INIT, which is F1. When I graph that window, it usually doesn't connect the dots, but it's zoomed in pretty far. So graphing with an initial window will not connect the dots. I can also try on this one if I go to Shift View Window, my standard window. I thought I was in standard before, but I guess it wasn't. If I graph this one in standard, uh, sometimes it will connect the dots, sometimes it won't. It also depends from one calculator to the next. You have to know it never makes a heart monitor shape. So in this one, I can see clearly that my asymptote would be at x equals negative 2 and not connect the dots there. All right, so let's fill in the rest of the information. If I want to know the 0, I can tell the zeros or the x-intercepts. I would have one right here on my graph. If I want to find that, I can use my calculator to do it. I just go under G-Solve and I hit the root button. So my x-intercept is at x equals negative 2.3 repeating. I also could have done that by hand and, and worked it backwards. Um, that's negative 2 and a third. It doesn't matter to me whether you call it the fraction or the decimal, so long as you recognize both if it were multiple choice. If I wanted to write that as an x-intercept, I would usually write it as coordinates. But again, it doesn't matter so much to me. Um, so long as you get it, that it's the x value that's negative 2 and a third, and the y value is 0. This function is going to have a y-intercept because it does touch the y-axis. To find the y-intercept, I can either plug in 0 for x, or I can just go back in my calculator and I can g-solve for the y-intercept and my y-intercept is 3.5 so that's 0, 3.5 or I could call that 0, 3.5 and, and I could again do that by either plugging 0 into the original and then getting 1.5 plus 3 or by just using my calculator at my table. All right, for where am I increasing or decreasing on this thing? I remember I'm drawing from left to right. So this entire time, the function's going down. That was one piece, and then I have a second piece up here 
where the entire time it's decreasing. It's really flattening out on the ends, but it's still technically decreasing. So I want to label my arrows. I'm like I normally would. My left arrow over here is on the left, so x is negative infinity. The y value of that arrow would be getting closer to the asymptote, which is 3. I've got an arrow that's pointing down. The x value for that one would be near negative 2, which is the asymptote. The y value for that arrow would be negative infinity because it's going down, which is negative. I have an arrow pointing up on the top. Its x value is close to negative 2. Its y value is up, so it's infinity. I have an arrow on the right. Its x value is on the right, so it's infinity. And its y value is getting closer to 3. So when I'm going to describe what I'm doing, I was never increasing. I was always decreasing. So where do my intervals start? My first piece starts over here at negative infinity, and it ends down here at negative 2. So I'm going to write negative infinity is less than x is less than negative 2. Then I have a second piece of my function. This function is starting at negative 2 and going to infinity. So for that piece, I'm going to say negative 2 is less than x is less than infinity. My increasing and decreasing should cover all values of x except that vertical asymptote, which is what it does. For the end behavior, I have as x approaches infinity, what is y doing? As x was approaching infinity, was over here on the right side. As x was approaching infinity, y was going to 3. Again, that's the horizontal asymptote. It should match up because the horizontal asymptote is telling you what's happening on the ends. As y approaches negative, or sorry, as x approaches negative infinity, that's the left. So over here on the left, what's y doing? y is also approaching 3. The domain of this function, going back to my anchor point right here in the middle, and domain, I want to think as I go from left to right, what can I equal? So for my domain, as I go from left to right, I can equal everything except that asymptote. Oops, I want to write usually x such that, no, I'm on the highlighter. I've got x such that x is not equal to negative 2, because that's the x value of the asymptote, and my range, y such that y is not equal to 3, because that was the y value of my horizontal asymptote. So x and y were not allowed to be equal to their asymptotes that I had up here. So we should now be able to do any transformation of our parent function. Again, our parent function was f of x equals 1 over x. Realize that anything that happens down here would be considered the inside. So that would affect us left and right. If I have a negative, if I have addition, if I have multiplication, that's all the inside. Anything that happens out front, up here, on the end, those would all be considered the outside of this function because they're not in there with the x, and that's going to affect us up and down. Come into class with any questions you have next class, and we'll be graphing some of these.